and introduce some of the terms that may not be as familiar to all uh, in this particular arena. My disclosures are listed in the AGA handbook. What I'm going to do is focus on several aspects of uh, biosimilars, the economics, what are biosimilars, some of the EU and the uh, FDA, if you would, definitions, and then to talk about the biosimilar landscape and a little bit about the technology directly. We're fortunate, really, to have uh, terrific speakers today, which I'll introduce as uh, they come to the uh, podium. And one of the things that's recognizable is that in 2009, the Biologic Price Competition and Innovation Act came to place. And this is an abbreviated licensure pathway uh, that is done to be showing biologic products uh, help gain entry into market. If they're biosimilar or interchangeable through an FDA licensed product. If we look at the overall economics of biosimilars, based on some data that was published in 2015, they accounted for 1% of all prescriptions, but accounted for 28% of drug spending. So these are some very important economics to keep in mind. If you look as well, the average cost in 2013 for a biologic agent in the United States per day was $45 versus $2 for a chemical drug. Global sales estimated back uh, a while in 2013 to be, by 2017, were estimated to be $180 billion. Um, if we look at this, about 50% of the sales coming from 11 biologic agents will face exclusivity loss by 2022. And the cumulative savings that have been estimated, and they vary, but these are some of the numbers in the EU and the US as a result of biosimilars could exceed 56 billion in aggregate over the next five years, up to 112 billion. So these are things that can be advantageous to healthcare in general. The cost is considerably more than a small molecule uh, given the aspects of the manufacturing, the quality control, the marketing, the storage, the special requirements for pharmacovigilance, um, and they're not as able to be discounted as much as these small molecules. Small molecules may be 50 to 80 percent discounts uh, compared to the originator products. In the EU, if we look, there have been about a 30 percent price reduction based on recent publications. And if you look across Europe, they can go as far as 69% for CTP13, uh, which is in Norway directly. So they vary by region and they vary by government status. So you may say, what are biosimilars? And there are several definitions that have been put forth, but I use one that the FDA has used uh, on their website. The biologic product is highly similar to the reference product, notwithstanding minor differences in clinically inactive components. And there's no clinically meaningful difference between the biologic purity and the reference product in terms of safety, purity, and potency of the product. So with that in mind, they have to be essentially the same strength, the dosage, injectable, for example, they have to be, and the route of administration needs to be the same as the originator, directly. So you may say, well, how else do they differ? And these are some of the differences one might see. The composition, protein versus organic compound. The structure is a variable 3D structure compared to a well-defined structure. The route of administration, IV or sub-Q. And degradation differs as well as mechanism of action. Blocking or depletion as opposed to enzyme inhibition is a characteristic prototypic examples directly. Manufacturing costs we recognize as well, and they require more labor and regulate, uh, regulatory aspects when it comes to bio, biologic products manufacturing, and it's a more expensive quality control and stability testing. So these are things that differentiate in general strokes, but not individually. And if you look at terms, you may see terms out there as a bio better or a bio superior. And that is not a biosimilar. This is a new class of biosimilars which go beyond the mimicking of the originator product, and they provide improvements, if you would, in one of the various aspects of the clinical profile through changes in the chemistry, the alteration, in the formulation, and the innovative delivery, if you would. 
And we're going to talk some about interchangeability, so I'll define that term, if you would, uh, the medicinal practice of changing one medicine from an for another that's expected to achieve the same clinical result in a given clinical setting, and in any patient that should be on the initiative or with the agreement of the prescriber. So let's look at some of the principles, if you would, that have been set forth. Uh, and these are uh, extrapolation of indication, and I'll define what that is. So it's um, scientific justification for extrapolation should really address several issues. The mechanism of action in each condition in which the particular agent is uh, searching licensure, the pharmacokinetics and the biodistribution of the product in different patient populations, the immunogenicity of the product in different patient populations, differences in expected toxicities in each condition and use in patient populations, and any factor that could affect the safety or efficacy of the product in each condition of use uh, in patient population for which licensure is sought. Now these differ from the EMA suggestions. And I put these up for completeness sake, but we'll not review these at this point in time. There's some fine lines of differences that the US and the EMA has directly. So to put this in a schematic, you may have examples as what we have are a phase three study in rheumatoid arthritis and a phase one study in ankylosing spondylitis that led to extrapolation extrapolation of the indications of agents already approved. So this is, for example, infliximab as we know it today in clinical practice uh, had been approved for Crohn's, ulcerative colitis, psoriatic arthritis, uh, pediatric Crohn's and plaque psoriasis, but not necessarily pediatric ulcerative colitis. And again, these are things that are we can talk about. The majority were extrapolated based on the biosimilarity exercise by comparing it to the product we know with infliximab as Remicade. And we'll talk about the nomenclature, if you would, of the different agents. And it's really based on the totality of the evidence. One size does not fit all. And this was barred from the FDA website directly um, to show what was there. Clinical animal studies, clinical immunogenicity, clinical knowledge that's post-marketing experience, pharmacokinetics, pharmacodynamics, and structural and functional characterization. So the one-size-fits-all hypothesis is not the situation that comes about. And the FDA scientists will evaluate the applicant's integration of various types of information to provide advice on scope and extent um, of the developed plan, and ultimately, an overall assessment that's biologic product or is not biosimilar to an approved reference product. So that's the general concept. And if you look directly, different regulations exist in different countries. The US, the EU, Japan, Canada, WHO has suggested things. And they're similar, but they're not the same, if you would. So these are the biosimilar equivalents of the uh, extrapolation. And when doing so, one looks at the totality of the evidence. The amino acid structure would be part of the quality of the structure and function. One would look at pharmacology and clinical as well. Differences in glycosylation, post-translation modification, uh, and you should match the effector function regardless of the potential contribution to the mechanism. The pharmacokinetics in healthy volunteers is the most sensitive population in general to assess the kinetic similarity. Equivalent PK and pharmacodynamics with dose response experience can infer clinical efficacy if they're sensitive and the relative marker is available to look at. And then clinically, clinical efficacy in randomized, blinded, head-to-head -head study in a sensitive population with sensitive endpoints is advocated directly. Clinical safety confirmed in at least one sensitive patient population used as monotherapy with enough exposure and time to gain evidence from the data. And then immunogenicity with drug tolerant assays in sensitive population with no concomitant immune suppression. And these in aggregate are looked at. And it's each step has a critical contribution to the totality of the evidence 
that's being there, and each step should rely on the most sensitive state-of-the-art capabilities. No step can refute or overcome differences in other development steps, and it should satisfy, satisfy all three steps to determine biosimilarity. So just as a background, what's been done? In the U.S., there were two trials uh, looking at infliximab, CTP13, the biosimilar, uh, and the trials were such that they were done in different disease states. Rheumatoid arthritis and the Planetra was a phase three study and ankylosing spondylitis, the Planeta study, was a phase one study. The population was RA versus ankylosing spondylitis and the numbers of patients were significant and various endpoints were looked at. The ACR20 uh, at week 30 and the PK equivalents at steady state. And these were then evaluated and the endpoints were met for the studies. Now, this is of interest because there's now over 20 biosimilars in various phases of development in the U.S. and abroad uh, looking at infliximab and adalimumab alone. And these are the agents that have come at the time where they're no longer exclusive, if you would. Different countries do different things. If you look in Germany, payers are giving targets for physicians uh, prescribing of biosimilars. In Norway, payer attention to pharmacists to substitute has been something that has been done. Amgen went against this, they sued and they won, and Norway is now appealing. Not appealing, now appealing. And Brazil has separate things directly, so they differ throughout the world as to how things are done. We currently have a nomenclature that is accepted, and it's different from the standard biologic nomenclature. In August 2015, the FDA set forth a rule for naming biosimilars, and the name includes distinguishing suffixes, which are devoid of meaning, and it's four random lowercase letters. So, for example, Remicade as we know it is infliximab HJMT directly. The intention is to avoid an accurate perception of biosimilar efficacy, influence prescribing patterns directly. And then we have infliximab DYYB, or Inflectra, which gained uh, approval April 2016. Infliximab ABDA, which is Renflexus, which in April gained approval. And then Adalimumab ATTO, otherwise known as Amgevita, which gained approval in September 2016. So this is easier for tracking if there is a safety issue and also for distinguishing and saying that they are biosimilars. There are many questions that come to mind, I'm sure, in the audience and in people's uh, direct consideration. We're going to answer some of those today for you, so I pose. The pathway to biosimilars is a work in progress, but a lot is known, a lot has been done. How comfortable will physicians be prescribing agents? How comfortable will patients be using biosimilars? How will insurers manage these agents? Can we switch from native biologic to biosimilar without immunizing the patient? And we'll talk about some of that. And can we do a double switch without immunizing from native to biosimilar and then back to another biosimilar? And these are questions that are obvious in the mind of clinical practice as well as investigators. Turn the microphone over to Dr. Stacy Ricci. And Dr. Ricci is in the uh, Food and Drug Administration and the Therapeutic Biologic Biosimilar Staff in the Office of New Drugs. Thank you. Hello. Thank you, uh, Dr. Lichtenstein, for that uh, very nice introduction. You, you touched upon many of the topics that I'll go over. And it's good to emphasize um, and repeat them uh, because they're, they're complicated. This biosimilars represent a new licensure pathway for the FDA and it's um, different from what the traditional drug development design that we think of. Um, so just to briefly go over what I'll, I'll discuss, I'll give some of the statutory framework that the um, Biologics Price Competition and Innovation Act provided to the FDA for the licensure of biosimilars. I'll review the terminology and also some of the general requirements that are needed in a biosimilar application submitted to the FDA. And, and also I'll review what the stepwise approach um, means to de developing a biosimilar and, and FDA's recommendations uh, as, as such, and also some unique development concepts that um, are specific for biosimilars and interchangeables. 
So the, the BPCI Act, or I'll just refer to it as the Act, uh, was uh, approved uh, as part of the Affordable Care Act in 2010, and it created this abbrevi abbreviated licensure pathway for biologic products that are shown to be biosimilar or interchangeable with an FDA-licensed reference product. So what's a reference product? That refers to the single biologic product that was licensed under Section 351A of the Public Health Service Act. And um, the Public Health Service Act gives FDA the authority to license biologic products. Um, the, an application that's submitted under Section 351A is considered a standalone application. And that would contain all the information and data necessary to demonstrate that the proposed product is safe, pure, and potent for use. And as Gary uh, described, the, the statute contains these two requirements, these two criteria, in order to, for a product to, to be considered biosimilar. And that is that the product is um, shown to be highly similar to the reference product, notwithstanding minor differences in clinically inactive components. And so that would mean if there are formulation differences, for example, of the biosimilar compared to the reference product and that there are no clinically meaningful differences between the two products in terms of safety, purity, and potency, or safety and, effect and effectiveness. Interchangeability means, um, has three criteria. First is that it's biosimilar, and second, that it can be expected to produce the same clinical result as the reference product in any given patient, and that for a product that is administered more than once um, to a patient, there, in terms of safety, in t the risk in terms of safety or diminished efficacy of alternating um, or switching between use of the product and the reference product back and forth um, is not greater than using the reference product alone. And so what this means in practice is that an interchangeable product may be substituted um, for the res reference product without the inter intervention of the healthcare provider, so at the pharmacy level. Um, what's required for a, a 351K application or a biosimilar application? The, um, the applicant will submit, among other things, comparative data comparing their biosimilar product with the reference product, um, both analytically and, cl and clinical data, as well as publicly available information regarding um, FDA's previous determination that the reference product is safe and effective. And this licensure pathway is um, based on, in comparison to the 351A standalone pathway, less than a full complement uh, of product-specific preclinical and clinical data. And this is why it's called abbreviated. So <clears throat> the, what does this mean, abbreviated? It does not mean less than in terms of um, any uh, information that's required to support its safe, um, pure, and potent. And um, it's, it, it's, the, it's a different standard that's applied to the biosimilars. And so the data package that's required for a biosimilar or, or interchangeable product is very extensive. And it includes analytical data, comparative analytical data, non-clinical data, and clinical data. Um, and then once a biosimilar or an interchangeable has been approved, it, uh, uh, healthcare providers can expect it to be just as safe and effective as the reference product that it was compared to. Okay, so let's go over some of the um, um, information that's needed for the application. And so the first, uh, the first uh, the point that must be met is that, it, that the product is considered biosimilar. And that also that it's clearly described that it utilizes the same mechanism or mechanisms of action for the proposed condition of use, meaning indication or, or uh, dosing regimen, but only to the extent that the mechanisms are known for the reference product. And the conditions of use and the proposed labeling for the biosimilar have been previously approved for the reference product. It has the same route of administration, dosage form, and strength as the reference product, and is manufactured, um, processed, packed, or held in a facility that meets the same standards designed to assure that the biologic product continues to be safe, pure, and potent. Um, the, the 351K application must also include um, information demonstrating biosimilarity 
based on data derived from anal analytical studies demonstrating the product is highly similar, animal studies including the assessment of toxicity, and a clinical study or studies including the assessment of immunogenicity and pharmacokinetics or pharmacodynamics that are sufficient to demonstrate safety, purity, and potency in one or more conditions of use for which the reference product is licensed. So this does not mean that each of these data elements are required. FDA can determine that um, one of the data elements is not uh, relevant for the product or is not needed. So what are some key development concepts that differentiate biosimilars from standalone development? Um, so let me just make sure I hit all the points I wanted to do. So the goals are different. And um, so on the left, this is the um, traditional drug development concept that people are familiar with where you have collect analytical data, non-clinical data, clinical pharmacology data, and you proceed through the safety um, and dose range finding clinical studies until uh, if hopefully the, the, um, the product appears to be uh, efficacious and a f one or more phase three studies are conducted in the given indication that in which licensure is sought. In contrast, for the 351K pathway, the goal is to demonstrate biosimilarity or interchangeability and it's not to independently establish the safety and efficacy of the product. And so the abbreviated pathway means that the product can be approved on less than a full complement of product-specific preclinical and clinical data because the biosimilar sponsor is relying on information that's already known about the reference product. And so this approach uh, avoids unnecessary, expensive, and unethical duplications of studies and allow safe and effective products to be made available to patients faster and at a potentially lower cost. And as this figure is meant to convey, where while the studies needed for product development overlap, um, the relative emphasis on each data element is different between the two pathways. Um, <clears throat> a second uh, uh, key concept that the FDA recommends is that a stepwise approach is taken to generating data in support of a demonstration of biosimilarity, where first the, um, the, the stepwise approach begins with comparative analytical studies. And um, the sponsor should then consider the role of animal studies if they are needed for their product, um, and then move on to con conduct the comparative clinical PK and PD studies, including an assessment of immunogenicity um, and Based and then at each step, the um, the uncertainty about what's known between the similarity between the two products would dictate the design of the studies that then follow. So, if following the the clinical PK, PD, and immunogenicity assessments, if no further information would be needed, then a comparative clinical study in a patient population to demonstrate equivalence eff efficacy may not be needed. Um, and this is what's meant by the totality of the evidence to support the demonstration of biosimilarity. And again, the, the above list does not mean that every, every type of data described is necessary for a given biosimilar. Uh, a third key concept is that the analytical similarity data uh, form the foundation of the biosimilar development program. That's why it's like the biggest box at the bottom of the pyramid. There's extensive physical, chemical, and functional characterization uh, comparing the biosimilar product to the reference product. And <clears throat> to do this, multiple lots of the biosimilar product are generated and, and tested, as well as even more lots of the reference product are tested. And as, um, as you can imagine, there's all these different uh, analyses are run, not only on the primary sequence being identical, which is, which is part of the requirement, but that there's uh, the secondary and tertiary structure of the protein molecules are highly similar, <clears throat> that the thermal and temporal stability of the biosimilar product is, is uh, highly similar to the um, reference product, and that the, and, and most importantly, that the biologic activity, the evaluation 
of the attributes that indicate the mechanisms of action for the product are similar. And usually the tests that are run for that, there's more than one that, that would evaluate the same, um, the same uh, um, mechanism, um, and so on. So, and then the, um, a, a fourth key concept is that the role of clinical studies differs from the standalone, for bisolomer differs from the standalone program. And the nature and the scope of the studies will depend on the extent of residual uncertainty about the bios biosimilarity of the two products after conducting um, this extensive analytical analysis. And the types of clinical data that um, the FDA seeks are first based in the in similar PK and, and where relevant, similar PD, because these are considered um, the most sensitive clinical endpoints for assessing differences between the products should they exist. Um, typically, the PK measurements involve um, area under the curve calculations and CMAX um, comparisons in a sensitive population. It may be healthy, healthy, um, healthy volunteers, but it, it may not be ethical to, to conduct the study in healthy volunteers, in which case uh, a patient population would be used for that evaluation. <clears throat> and if the uh, PD biomarker is available, then it would reflect a known biologic effect of the drug. The, the PK and PD similarity data support the demonstration um, based on, this, on the assumption that the similar exposure of the biosimilar to the reference product would um, be representative of similar safety and efficacy. Um, the the uh, Establishing that there are no clinically meaningful differences in the immune response between the proposed biosimilar and the reference product is also a key element in the demonstration of biosimilarity. And in certain cases, as I said, P, uh, an evaluation of PK, PD, and immunogenicity may be sufficient um, to support the clinical, the clinical criteria of that there being no clinically meaningful differences between the biosimilar and the reference product. And, Otherwise, then a comparative clinical study is conducted in a patient population that compares the biosimilar to the reference product. And um, the, the study design features, including the pop study population, the endpoints, sample size, and study duration, should be adequately sensitive to detect um, differences between the two products, should they exist. Okay, and the final concept that I will uh, discuss is extrapolation, which um, Gary touched on. And this is a, this is a difficult one um, for uh, a lot of clinicians especially. So the potential exists for the biosimilar product to be approved for one or more condition of use for which the reference product is licensed based on extrapolating data um, that's intended to support the demonstration of biosimilarity from one condition of use to other conditions of use, meaning the, the biosimilar development program would not need to have a clinical study in every indication in order to be licensed to treat those indications. In order to do this, sufficient scientific justification for extrapolating the data from the biosimilar product, I'm sorry, from the reference product to the biosimilar product is necessary. And F FDA guidance outlines the factors to consider to support this justification. And these include what are the known and potential mechanisms of action in each indication? What are the PK and biodistribution in the different patient populations? Are there immunogenicity differences in different pa patient populations? Are there differences in expected toxicity in each condition of use and patient population? And, or are there any other factors that could affect the safety or efficacy of the product in each condition of use which, um, uh, for which licensure is being sought? So if there are differences, these have to um, be analyzed for the biosimilar product and all the features that would impact those, uh, those uh, factors would need to be described. So to provide another um, cartoon to explain this, um, Again, for standalone drug development, this is the typical clinical um, uh, progression for collecting information in order to support um, the first indication that the product receives a license for, the second, third, fourth, uh, 
So, you know, phase three um, efficacy, safety and efficacy studies are done. For biosimilar, um, this is different. So the goal of the, um, the biosimilar is to, to show that the, the product is um, both highly similar, notwithstanding, um, uh, in, you know, highly similar from the analytical and PK perspective, and that there are no clinically meaningful differences between the two products. And once this demonstration of biosimilarity similarity has been achieved, then the data from the reference product um, can be used to support the, uh, the additional indications for the biosimilar product based on the evaluation of those factors that we outlined already. So in summary, I hope um, that these concepts have been laid out a little more clearly um, of your understanding of biosimilarity. And so the development of a biosimilar product is different from the standalone product development. And the development goal is not to reestablish safety and effectiveness, but to demonstrate the product is highly similar to the reference product and that there are no clinically meaningful differences. The analytical comparisons between the two products are the foundation for determining whether products are highly similar. Clinical PK and and or PD, if relevant, is gener generally considered the most sensitive endpoint for detecting differences between products. An assessment of immunogenicity is needed, and a comparative clinical study um, is conducted if questions, residual uncertainty remains about the biosimilarity of the products. The biosimilar is approved based on the totality of evidence that's submitted by the applicant, and they are approved based on the same high standard at standards as for other therapies, and they are safe and effective when used for their labeled indications. So there have been five biosimilar products approved by the FDA, the first being Zarzio in March of 2015, the most recent being Renflexus that was approved uh, just last month. Um, and then some useful links, which I realize are going to be too long for you to <laughs> write down, but. There's, uh, if you go to the FDA.gov website, there's a lot of information about biosimilars. There's a CME course, online course that you can take, um, and if you just search for it, you can find it. There's uh, eight available guidance documents from the FDA about bi biosimilars, guidance for industry documents. And also, um, it might be of interest for people who want to learn more about um, the concepts of, and how they were, have been publicly um, described by looking at the transcripts or by viewing the uh, advisory committees meeting, meetings that have exist have occurred for the products, including the two for um, the uh, infliximab and the adalimumab products, would be in under the arthritis advisory committee um, meeting web web page. Okay, with that. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Dr. Brian Fagan from University of Western Ontario. Dr. Fagan will give us an overview of clinical considerations and use of biosimilars for gastrointestinal disorders. I abbreviated the title somewhat. Um, well, thank you, Gary. It's a pleasure to be here. And um, I think the intent of selecting me was to provide sort of a counterpoint to the regulatory opinion and try to put it into perspective a clinician's view of a rapidly changing environment. And surprisingly enough, clinicians don't like change. And uh, so the whole uh, area is somewhat unsettling to them, and I'll try to go through why that is and perhaps uh, re give some reassurance, but maybe allow some also different, um, maybe new worries. So we've heard biosimilars are not generic drugs they're, because they're not identical to the innovator. Why might it matter? immunogenicity, and I'm going to come back to this theme. I mean, I think this is the crunch issue, really, from a clinical perspective. The immune system has developed over millions of years to do one thing, to differentiate self from non-self, and it's very good at it. It's exquisitely good at it. But it is influenced, whether you're sensitized or tolerized, by many covariates, and we have to think about those covariates in the clinical context. And um, sensitization has consequences, and uh, gastroenterologists especially know this because when we first got our first biologic, 
within about a year we recognized that we had a huge problem with sensitization due to the way we were administering infliximab uh, as a solo agent uh, intermittently. That didn't turn out too really well. And um, so I guess I could cut to the chase here and I think that the concept of interchangeability or non-medical switching really is the crunch issue for, from a clinical perspective and I'll walk you through that. And little is known about that in humans. So we've heard earlier that these are complex molecules, they're not uh, small molecules like aspirin or penicillin. And really one of the key issues is the quaternary structure and that refers to the glycosylation patterns of monoclonal antibodies that are complex and um, given the number of potential branching variations, the degrees of freedom in tacking on sugar molecules, there's an infinite number of structures with these molecules. Mammalian cells are bad employees. Uh, they don't do what you tell them to do. They do what they want to do when it comes to making sugar residues. So there's really a lot of complexity in structure and differences in uh, um, identity. So I'm going to address just a couple issues and I'll start with extrapolation and um, the whole approval process which was direct, addressed by Dr. Ritchie. And I think the issue here, there's a couple issues from a clinical perspective of why we feel that perhaps if we had a do-over again on the um, approval process for our first biosimilar that we might do it a little bit differently. And I would submit that the reg regulatory environment has been influenced by the generic drug regulatory process. And why I say that is that there's two issues here. Um, you know, the issue of comparability. The regulatory environment has requested not non-inferiority studies, but equivalency study. And that, though, that study is very, that, that concept is very important in generic drug development where you're approving by PK. Because with small molecules, you want to know whether there's not enough drug and, or there's too much drug. So two-sided testing. Whereas in clinical medicine with, a, with a monoclonal antibodies, generally a clinician just wants to know to make sure that the new product, the biosimilar product, is no worse than, than, the, um, than the reference product. And that has big sample size implications and estimation problems if you're trying to do two-sided testing and two-sided estimation. So that's one ex aspect of things that I think is a little bit different than the way we think in clinical medicine. Here's another one. Um, this was the really pivotal study, Plantaris, uh, conducted in rheumatoid arthritis with an ACR20 score as the endpoint. And you can see that the doesn't matter which bar is the, is the active drug versus the, 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 well, the innovator reference product versus the biosimilar. They're, they're very similar for these endpoints at multiple time points. But um, one of the, the concepts that comes from a regulatory perspective is this notion of assay sensitivity. And you'll recognize the phrase there, assay sensitivity. Clinicians don't talk about assay sensitivity. So if I translate that, what that means is if a difference exists, you want the indication that is most sensitive to detect a dif difference clinically, if you're going to do a clinical study, um, that possible. You want the, the, the indication that, that is most specific and sensitive. And I would submit that that is not ACR20 scores in rheumatoid arthritis. The ACR20 score is a kind of fuzzy clinical measure. It uh, is very nonspecific and high placebo rates associated with it. So what would we, what we might do that is an alternative, I was asked a gastroenterologist which condition you would like to see a um, assay sensitivity, highly specific study, it probably would be which of our diseases? Well, ulcerative colitis. We have a huge problem with pharmacokinetics in that situation, so there's high variability among patients, and it would really stress test a monoclonal antibody unlike our ACR20 scores in rheumatoid arthritis. Moreover, we have a very objective endpoint in ulcerative colitis. We have endoscopy, which is highly sensitive and highly specific. So there's different philosophically, uh, you know, you can argue why this was done. Uh, rheumatoid arthritis is five times as prevalent as uh, ulcerative colitis, so it's easy to do the studies. So I'd suggest that there are um, philosophical differences between clinicians and regulatory authorities. No offense to regulatory authorities. Um, so I think I can end this part of things, so the approval process, the extrapolation project, the game is over. The regulatory authorities are the highest court in the land, 
and globally they've ruled. And so these drugs are on the market, they've ruled safe and effective, and so substitution by your friendly pharmacist or payer is going to happen, and there's not a lot you're going to be able to do about that, and perhaps there's not a lot you should do about it, because they've met the bar that way. I would submit the far bigger problem is non-medical switching and the risk of immunogenicity. And we've learned the hard way that immunogenicity is a problem. And you can imagine multiple switching scenarios. So in the first case, it's a one-way switch. Then you can imagine multiple switches within a given product and reference product. And then very complex situation. We've already seen now we have two TNF blocker biosimilars. And, or three, actually. Um, you could imagine multiple switches with different products, and that gets very complicated. And perhaps this is an immunological stress test. We know in animal models that one of the ways of breaking tolerance is giving molecules that are very similar but not identical uh, intermittently. So the question, if you're going to evaluate this, how many switches do you need to establish interchangeability? What clinical results are needed to be successful in establishing that? And then multiple different agents have, could be evaluated as well. <laughs> the history of uh, immunogenicity to form proteins goes back a long time. And this is Peter Medawar in Australia, who received, along with McFarland Burnett, the Nobel Prize in Medicine for their discovery of the factors that determine tolerance versus sensitization. And they did a number of experiments over the years working with influenza vaccine and worked this all out uh, in the 1940s. And it's funny that we didn't really understand that in the 1990s when we started to approve um, foreign proteins for administration. But we've come to recapitulate the lessons that were available in the 40s. And essentially, there are multiple factors. Uh, genetics are really important. You can breed animal strains, mice, that will, not, will never tolerize to a foreign protein. Alternatively, you can breed mice that will uniformly tolerize to a foreign protein. Root of administration is important, that generally, if you put uh, antigen into the skin subcutaneously, that's where the macrophages are in the tissue, and that tends to be a more immunogenic route than giving intravenously. Concomitant medications, so we have numerous examples in gastroenterology where combination therapy is effective in preventing sensitization in distinction to monotherapy. How, how much drug you give matters, and I don't think I've ever seen a dose-finding study in, with any molecule in which the highest dose didn't have lower rates of sensitization than the lowest dose. And we used to blame that on that we didn't have um, drug-resistant assays. So if you, the old ELISA te test that you can't detect antibody to drug in the presence of residual drug. And so, you know, we said, well, that's probably why the, you're, if you give more drug, you're less likely to detect drug, anti-drug antibodies. We now have new generation ELISAs and uh, HPLC tests that really get around that problem, and we're still seeing this phenomenon that high doses of drug actually reduce the risk of sensitization. And the most recent example, I, I think that it's very relevant to gastroenterologists, is ustekinumab, which has recently been approved. And we're giving high doses, much higher doses than in psoriasis. And generally, we observe, when you compare broadly across diseases, psoriasis versus Crohn's disease, Crohn's intrinsically has higher rates of sensitization. And with the ustekinumab program, we're, also, we're seeing lower rates than we observe with uh, psoriasis with the same assay. And this may be a reflection that we're giving a lot more drug up front and tending to tolerize. Um, one uh, really important lesson we've learned that it's not the cell line that you grow the protein up that determines immunogenicity. There are no human amino acids. There's just the three-dimensional structure of the foreign protein and your T cell repertoire. And those two interact together to determine whether you sensitize or tolerize. So, and so let's talk about the experience in IBD. Here's our original um, first look at this problem in the New England Journal. This was, came out of Leuven. And in the days of intermittent uh, use of infliximab, which was a really bad strategy, we saw that the anti-drug antibody teeter determined the time in remission. There was a positive association in that if you had anti-drug antibodies that you were less likely to be in remission and less likely to stay duration of remission. And that also was associated with the presence of infusion reactions. 
Just to reinforce the concept that humanization does not solve this problem, this is a very large cohort in rheumatoid arthritis in the Netherlands, looking at patients from new onset treated with adalimumab and looking at the proportion of anti-drug antibodies to adalimumab over time. And this population had a high prevalence of background methotrexate therapy as well. And what you see here is that you get anti-drug antibody formation rates of approaching 30% and that the majority of sensitization occurs within the first 12 weeks or so with a molecule that is, quotation marks, fully human. So you can imagine that if we're going to have drugs that aren't the same and we're switching between them, that we might have a problem with immunogenicity as a stress test. And so we need to evaluate that with potential switch studies. And I understand the FDA has recently issued a guidance about the types of studies that they might want to see to allow non-medical switching in the context of having multiple different agents available, and perhaps we can talk about that later. One thing I will say is that I don't think this study has helped very much. This is the NORSWITCH study. It was uh, funded by the Norwegian government, and um, it was quite amusing when the investigator presented this study for the first time. He said, one really advantage of this study is it's supported by the Norwegian government, so we're not biased like those pharma studies. So I mean, is it, who's going to be the benefit of drug of getting biosimilars is going to be the Norwegian government, but I'll give them that. The Norwegian government did fund this study to their credit. Um, and this is, was a one-way switch study with um, CTP13, which is Inflectra, versus Infliximab um, reference product. And essentially the patients had stable, duration, stable remission for six months and then they were randomized one-to-one -to, -one to switch to the drug and they had an open label extension out to 78 weeks, but the primary endpoint was at week 52. Now, Norwegian, Norway's a small country, and to actually do the study, they took the expedient um, route of entering multiple uh, diseases, and immediately this alienated a lot of clinicians. Um, however, having said that, 50% of the patients in the trial either had Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis. Um, so you had to be in stable remission, and obviously you had to have definitions of remission that were different across the different indications. And then similarly for the primary endpoint, the endpoint was failure, um, disease worsening, and that would have to be unique to all of the different indications. Now here's an issue that um, as a methodologist, a problem, the disease margin here was 15%, and I'm not going to terrorize you with the, all the issues of non-inferiority study. But uh, this is a problem because certainly in IBD, we would consider a non-inferiority margin of 15% as very generous. And I think that equally applies to rheumatoid arthritis. A non-inferiority margin in, in IBD, we would consider a, a minimum clinically important difference of 15% as being a minimum important difference. So you can use a very empiric rule if you cut the clinically important difference in half, a lot of times that translates into a non-important difference and that would be 7.5%. If you do the sample size for that calculation, you end up with a number of around 1,200 patients and this was far less than that. Just illustrating that there was good proportion of Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis patients in this trial and here's the primary analysis. If you turn down to the point estimate, and these are presented as two-sided confidence intervals, um, you can see that the trial, that the line of identity overlaps one. So this is a positive study. The point estimate favored the reference product, but by the definition of the primary endpoint with the 15% margin, this study met its primary endpoint. Um, clinicians love subgroup analysis. And so when they saw these data, the first question is, well, what about the subgroup analysis in my disease? And one can see that with Crohn's disease, the point estimate actually comes very close to the line of identity, indicating, you see down at the bottom here, I don't have the pointer, um, that, and this immediately set off a furor that, in fact, this, this uh, reinforces my bias that Crohn's disease is different than rheumatoid arthritis, and I can't accept these results. I don't think that's a very valid criticism of this study. Uh, it wasn't powered to show differences in subgroup analysis. And in fact, if you actually look at a variety of other uh, endpoints with regard to Crohn's disease and the other indications, there really isn't a compelling, there's not consistency of the data, which would reinforce that the subgroup conclusion is valid. If you saw the same thing with multiple endpoints, you might accept that maybe it is real. 
But this should be hypothesis generating, not concluding that um, Norris Switch did not show a benefit, well, non-inferiority, oh God, um, in Crohn's disease. So I'm getting near the end here. And <laughs> okay, I'm not going to go back and do that. So what one of the slides I showed you was a, was a, was a snowflake. Okay, the last slide I had was a snowflake, and it showed different snowflakes, and the old adage that no two snowflakes are alike. And this is where I think the whole crunch question comes down to. So if you accept the fact that there's molecular heterogeneity within the reference drug, then what I said about being exposed to different molecules intermittently, that experiment has already been done. And that's why you have a 10% uh, rate of sensitization with monotherapy with the monoclonals. So don't worry about all this non-medical switching. It's all going to be fine because you've already been exposed to heterogeneic mixes of molecules. I think that's a hypothesis, and it needs to be tested. And I, I, at this, as someone who's interested in uh, immunogenicity and epidemiology and safety of patients, I would really like to see an experiment before I condone non-medical switching. And I think that, that at least the regulatory authority in the United States and Canada, I think, are coming around to that viewpoint, but I'd be interested in what the most recent perspective is. So to summarize, the reality is that the biosimilars are here. You're, they're going to be substitution based on cost. The, major, the only advantage of them really is cost. And we're going to see that, and you're going to have to live with that. Um, what's going to happen with non-medical switching remains to be seen, and I think that's something we should, um, in the absence of data, I'm not going to condone that personally as a physician. So I'll stop there. And Thank you. Thanks, Gary. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for coming. So actually, Gary uh, misread my title, except I actually changed my title to exactly what he said. So he and I were thinking the same, even though he didn't mean to. Uh, I was tasked with telling you why patients should know about biosimilars, but that was only the first four slides. Um, but then, of course, we need to answer a few other questions. Now, out of full disclosure, I do consult for some of the um, companies that are involved in producing biosimilars. Um, but this presentation is really 100% my own, and I take responsibility for it, of course. But the other disclosure I have is that I'm currently the chair of the Government and Industry Affairs Committee of the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation, and that has informed some of what I have to say today. So I actually broadened my talk. It's going to be about why patients should know about biosimilars, what patients should know about biosimilars, and how can they learn about them. So this is really meant to be very practical for you when you start talking to your patients about this, and hopefully when you advocate on behalf of your patients and encourage them to do so for themselves. So why should patients know about biosimilars? Well, that's almost rhetorical. Of course they should know about these agents because they're going to be receiving them. Uh, and this has to do with our relationship and, and what has traditionally been called the doctor-patient relationship, but of course is the provider-patient relationship. And that has to do with the choice and communication of therapeutic recommendations must include disclosing all appropriate treatment options, disclosing potential benefits and risks of these treatments. And of course in the modern era in the U.S. and, and elsewhere, after we do all that, we leave the room and then a payer gets in the middle. And that's a challenge for many of us, as we all know. It also has to do with respect for patient autonomy, which is the cornerstone of our shared decision-making model in uh, taking care of these individuals and understanding that patients have the right to refuse our recommendations, which, of course, occurs frequently. And lastly, uh, having patients informed and knowledgeable about their treatments and their management of their disease um, has been shown to enhance compliance, and it allows uh, additional informed and evidence-based decisions to be made on their behalf. So there's many reasons that you should be making sure your patients know and understand this. Now, of course, in order for you to do that, you have to understand it. So I'm grateful to my colleagues who have led the way today to give you some of that background, and I'm, of course, not going to repeat that. Now, there's actually a nice study in the IBD journal, the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation's journal that is um, actually uh, available online right now, 
and this was led by Brennan Spiegel and his group at Cedar sinai where they actually looked at the risks and benefits of biologics in IBD among patients using Twitter and e-forum discussions. So if you want to know how to use social media to get a publication in the IBD journal, I encourage you to read this paper. They looked at over 3,000 social media sites in the last uh, few years, and they identified major concerns that came up. And you should notice that among those concerns that were voiced by the patients, it included uh, non-biologic treatment alternatives, hesitation to initiate biological therapies in general, not just biosimilars, and the concept of changing or discontinuing regimens, as we know from our own practice. But this is what's going on out there. And they were able to quantify this using uh, sort of a social research um, project. And it was quite interesting. We also know, though, that patients have some perspectives on biosimilars. And because these agents have been available and are being used in Europe and Asia years before they have now arrived in the United States, we can look to our colleagues in Europe who have studied some of this. This is a survey by the European Federation of Crohn's and Ulcerative Colitis Association to its members um, who have inflammatory bowel disease. These are patient members, and it was performed in 2014 to 15. So this was right when biosimilars were um, becoming available in Europe, so in the early phase of everything. And about 45% of them were currently being treated with biologics, and only a third of those patients um, had heard, or a third of the patients in the survey had heard of biosimilars. Now, of those who had heard of biosimilars, they had some concerns, and I suspect our own patients in the United States have similar concerns. They worry about a safety profile. They worry about efficacy. They think that a lower cost of a biosimilar, or for that matter, any agent, should not come before their safety and efficacy. I think that certainly makes sense. And they want to know whether they're receiving the reference drug or the biosimilar and have any additional information necessary in writing before the drug becomes, um, is administered to them. So I think those are reasonable concerns they expressed. And you can see that a majority of patients said that that was important. In addition, they felt that extrapolation made sense, or at least um, a small number of them did. So the majority did not understand it in this survey. Uh, they were against the idea of interchangeability. About 20% of them said that if they um, were not aware, they thought it was not a good idea. And uh, only 30% of them said that they would be fully confident, even if their physician said, I'm comfortable with this. Now, this was a couple years ago. There hasn't been a follow-up survey of patients, but we can look at what the physicians in Europe have learned. And in this, um, I wouldn't call it longitudinal, but I would say two time point survey of the European uh, Crohn's and Colitis Organization physicians. In dark blue is 2015, more recent, and light blue is 2013. You can see the confidence and comfort level with biosimilars changed over time among our colleagues in ECHO. So in other words, before they had the agents and were using them, there was lots of hesitation and concern. After the agents were actually available and being used, uh, people were more confident and were comfortable using them. We don't know that this is um, going to be the same case as patients start receiving the drugs, but I actually think they will. And I think that Brian has made the case as well that this is almost a non-issue. It's going to be happening. And the more people are familiar with the agents, the more comfortable they may be. So those concerns and the minority of patients who said they were okay with biosimilars um, from a couple years ago are probably now outdated. What should patients know about biosimilars? Well, you've heard very nicely from the previous three speakers a bit more about what biosimilars are, how they're regulated, how they've been tested or tried, and what's happening in the, in the world of uh, biosimilars and specifically in IBD. But what should patients know about them? So I tried to focus in on what we should be communicating to our patients. The first one is that we have to try to explain to them that they're similar and what that actually means. And you've heard the definitions. Um, as we try to do this with patients, we want to hesitate and avoid using the term, this is a biologic generic. Um, and that's not accurate. Uh, so we need to try to use the right terms. Um, in general, we've accepted the extrapolation studies. You heard that the regulatory bodies have, and we um, as physicians who have been studying and understand this a bit more do as well, and we should tell our patients that. Um, but patients should be asking and know what drugs they're receiving. They should know how their payer or insurance company or health service is positioning the agents, and they should know whether this will cost them more or less. You know, we always talk about cost savings. We don't necessarily know that it, there may not be other costs to them if these agents aren't delivered properly or there are other challenges to getting them efficiently to market and to our patients. 
It's also important to at least acknowledge and understand this distinction. The FDA does have a designation called interchangeable and that no biosimilar in the U.S. currently has an interchangeable designation. That does not mean that these agents are not going to be switched uh, and it is happening as you've heard already and it's uh, something that you have to keep in mind and whether or not you pick that battle to fight in individual patients will depend on your comfort level and on evolving information as we are going along here. As Brian already outlined for you nicely, we don't yet have a study that shows the interchangeability as the FDA has outlined it, which would be back and forth between the reference product and the biosimilar or multiple biosimilars. Um, that hasn't been performed yet. And so the general concept of switching in a stable patient hasn't really been proven to the level that we might want it to. Uh, on the other hand, using a biosimilar as a first-line biologic in a patient seems completely reasonable based on what we've understood. So you can also think about the individual patient in front of you and the clinical scenario you're facing as to what you'd want to educate them about. For example, a new start uh, in general using a biosimilar as their agent or versus the reference product seems reasonable. If it's a primary non-responder, it doesn't seem to make sense that you would switch from the reference product to the biosimilar if you've demonstrated that the agent isn't working, maybe you've even done empiric dose escalation or gone so far as to look at therapeutic drug levels, uh, you may um, understand more about what's going on, but going to the biosimilar here would not be the right thing to do. And that's something we have to also explain to patients. I think it's important, even if we understand it at a core level, we're not going to write the prescription, we also mention that because we're anticipating payers won't put this together. So you may say, you know, I need to cycle you to another anti-TNF in class. And then the insurance company will say, I know that your doctor wanted you to get adalimumab as your next drug, but we've got a special this week on the biosimilar infliximab. Would you like to try that? Or they don't say it that way, but you know what I mean, guys. The third scenario is the stabilized responder. This is what we would call potentially the non-medical switch. The patient's doing well on an agent, and um, is it okay to just switch them over? Well, the European and Asian data so far, all this open label experience, um, and then the North switch study you saw with the caveats that it had a weird endpoint, and we can't really do the subset analyses, um, suggests that this might be safe in one direction. Uh, as Brian educated you, there have been these subtle changes in the, the molecules that occur even with a single agent, so that might be okay. Um, and then for a patient who's losing response, it's very important to remember and to teach your patients that the patient who's lost response to the reference agent or the biosimilar due to anti-drug antibodies, the biosimilar or the reference agent, depending which direction you're going, there will be cross-reactivity. So again, if the payer says, I know you want to go to this other agent because they developed anti-drug uh, anti antibodies, but we're going to give you the biosimilar. That is the wrong thing to do. Your patient will have a hypersensitivity reaction. So think carefully, and that's part of the discussion you're going to have with the patients. Patients do have a right to know what medication they're receiving. That's a thread through all the different position statements of the societies around the world. And of course, we'd like patients to understand what agent they're receiving. It's a bit complicated, as you've heard from a couple speakers, actually all three speakers, that we have these suffixes now that um, are used. So we have to have an understanding of what agent the patient's receiving uh, and the patient needs to know, and we have to try to keep this straight in our minds and in our records. Now there's been a variety of different uh, efforts to quantify the economic impact of biosimilars. I think this is complex. It could be a whole lecture unto itself, although perhaps a very boring one. Um, but the point here is that as the biosimilar has come to market at a lower price, it's taken over a market share. And so what you're seeing here on the right are graphs of different countries in the, U in the uh, European Union. And as the biosimilar um, CTP13 became available, you can see that its market share grew even when the CTP13 was the same price as the reference in um, its market share grew. I'm not sure exactly why that occurred. Um, the other thing to understand, and I would focus on the U.S. market, which is what I, un I know more about, is that there's no way that we're expecting patients to save money. Maybe the health system will save money, maybe the payer will save money or make more money by saving that money, but we don't expect patients' co-pays to go down. We don't necessarily expect that they're going to have more access to the agents because somebody's going to change the uh, criteria for getting your patient pre-authorized or reauthorized. So unfortunately, I'm cynical about that. 
And lastly, how should we be teaching our patients about this? Because this may sound a bit daunting in your 10-minute visit with your patients or whatever time you have when you're going over so many things that you have to talk about with your complex patients. There are some resources. So you saw the FDA resources, which I would suggest are useful for you and for your uh, team. But for patients, um, you want to also think about how you can refer them to some useful resources. So there's a webinar that uh, I did with one of my um, colleagues who's on the Government and Industry Affairs Committee that's available through the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation website. Uh, and there are some other resources that you might find useful, and these have been made directly for patients. I know also that the AGA working with the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation are working on some educational materials as well. And so lastly, I'll summarize the society position statements to encourage you to engage your patients, empower them, and perhaps together we can make sure that we're doing the best we can. Uh, in 2015, the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation uh, issued their position statement. They accepted extrapolation, uh, which was at the time distinct from the Canada Health position statement, although that's been modified. Um, we wanted the FDA to ensure thorough human testing, which of course they do. We wanted the FDA to provide reasonable proof that switching would not incur immunogenicity or loss of response, which I think it has done to a degree, but not completely. Um, we wanted to make sure that it was clear that the risk of cross-reactivity and immunogenicity of anti-drug antibodies from the innovator or reference agent to the biosimilar was being understood and communicated effectively. And we also requested unique identification numbers or names, which they have actually done now. We also encouraged this shared decision-making and transparency model, meaning that Patients and the providers should have a right to refuse a switch if they think it's not safe. They should have the right to write a prescription as dis dispensed as written, and we wanted that to be part of our um, platform. I'll tell you that in the real world, that's not really happening. It's just wholesale switching across infusion centers, third-party pharmacies, and specialty pharmacies right now. In 2016, uh, ECHO issued their position statement on biosimilars, mostly the same as what I said. I'm not going to read through all of this, but they emphasize that they have accepted extrapolation of indication. Um, they want registries and ongoing observational studies with long-term follow-up for safety. Uh, the adverse events and loss of response due to immunogenicity needed some more study, and they wanted to emphasize that important point that I've already mentioned. Uh, they also wanted to be able to trace and audit which drugs patients were receiving if there were concerns. And they said in their position statement that switching was acceptable after appropriate discussion between the healthcare team and a patient. The updated recommendations from Canada, um, and this was their updated ref uh, recommendations, um, said that they, uh, the authorization of a biosimilar was not a declaration of equivalence to the reference drug, but interchangeability can be determined at a provincial level. Doctors and their patients should be able to select the treatment option best suited to each patient's individual circumstances. So again, getting back to this, ultimately we should be able to decide and help influence these decisions, not a third party. Uh, and the patient who's in remission being treated with a reference or innovator product should not be forced to switch. A similar theme across all of these. Now, most recently in my last slide is just the update from the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation. This is in draft form, so don't hold me to this because we haven't reviewed it formally, but I wanted to share it with you because it's in the last week that we've been updating this. Just continuing to remind our colleagues um, and the patients that no biosimilar has achieved that interchangeable designation. Uh, we want patients and physicians to be informed of potential switches. That was in our original statement, but we're emphasizing it in this update. Um, and then very importantly, we said that if a switch was going to occur, there should be no delay in delivery of therapy because the bureaucratic problem of saying, well, this isn't what I wanted my patient to receive and they're being switched now or throwing the fa facts in the garbage when you do get notification, all those things you know are going to are going to result in a real world delay in therapy, which is the worst thing that can happen to our patients. So it's not enough to say they're being switched and it happens seamlessly and everybody's happy. There's the real possibility that there's going to be delay in delivery or the patient doesn't know about it and a new bag with a different name is being hung on the IV pole and then they say, stop, I don't know what this is, and then two weeks go by, they relapse or now they're going to receive essentially episodic drugging, a drug dosing. And then lastly, which we're continuing to discuss, is that we actually advocate for transparency on the reason for switching. 
we know and expect that this is probably due to pricing. It's in parentheses here because we don't actually expect that this is a necessary component of everything we're going to do, nor do we think anyone's going to actually allow us to ask for that. But we believe transparency about these things is important, and the foundation is going to take a stand on that. So if you look across the states in the United States, for my American colleagues who are here today, it's a state decision how pharmacies handle this information and how they notify. Um, I would refer you to a really nice um, website, the National Conference of State Legislatures. It's ncsl.org, where they update what's going on state by state uh, across many different issues. But you can look up the biosimilars, and they summarize some of the uh, issues that are, have been raised. Um, the individual patient should be notified that a substitute or switch has been made, and that provision is now included in at least 12 states in the U.S. And in some cases, now state law requires patient consent before any switch is made. So you need to know what state you're in, and you need to go to that website and look it up, and you can know what, what um, tools you have at your disposal on behalf of your patients. It's also not really known whether it will matter at all what these laws are and if anyone's going to enforce them, unfortunately. So I hope I've given you some nice um, guidance and practical points about what you can do with this, because these agents are here. As you've heard, extrapolation has occurred, and their drugs are now going to be um, in our patients. And I think there's a variety of important pieces of information you should be communicating to them in order to be most effective and to engage your patients as your partners in this process. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Rubin. We'll ask Dr. Fagan, Dr. Ricci to come up, and what we'll do is we'll take questions from the audience, uh, and we have questions that have been uh, sent in. So remember, gastro.cnf.io to send up. And uh, I'll post some questions that have been asked. Um, yeah, can I just clarify? Surely. So I, I, clearly, immunogenicity is a big concern. Um, for my fellow panelists, and it's something that's in the statute that the that the uh, uh, data to support immunogenicity of the biosimilar has been thoroughly evaluated. For the infliximab and the adalimumab products that have been approved as biosimilars, um, as part of the um, clinical study that was conducted in the RA population, they did receive what's called a single transition. We don't like to say switch because that we don't want to confuse. Uh, interchangeability concept, but so the patients that did receive um, the reference product were switched to the biosimilar, transitioned to the bio, so they received it. <laughs> so this was evaluated, and their, uh, the immunogenicity in those patients was looked at, the PK. Um, and so interchangeability is, if you look at the FDA guidance that was recently published in January, uh, it describes um, the minimum requirements for switching that would be um, uh, necessary in a clinical study to support interchangeability, and there has to be at least two switches back and forth from the reference product to the biosimilar. Um, so these are different concepts, and so just so, you, just so everyone in the audience realizes the, um, the data packages that, that supported the approval of the two uh, biosimilars did include a, um, an evaluation of the, of the switch from the uh, reference product to the biosimilar. Transition. So Brian, transition. do you have a comment? <laughs> yeah, I just wanted to talk about the issue of immunogenicity, and the, the devil is in the details as far as the assay goes, because um, any good chemist can measure drug, and um, you can either take patient samples and spike them, or you can take actual patient samples and correlate them with between assays, and you can, you can get a very good readout of whether you can measure drug, and I have no doubt about the existing assays on the market to measure Infliximab can do that. The problem is the anti-drug antibodies. And we know that from the pivotal study, the Inflector study, that the assay is nowhere for anti-drug antibodies, is no way comparable to the reference assay that was used in house in uh, originally Senecor, ultimately J&J, &J, and then was validated by, cross-validated by Prometheus. And to determine the cut point for clinically mean immunogenicity, it took a multi-center group five years, 1,400 samples, and we determined the cut point because you've got to walk it back to PK and clinical endpoints to do that. And, and that has not been done with any of the, bio, the biosimilars. If I'm not, I just I have a question I for you. I don't know. If, I, I would disagree with okay. my colleague on that. <laughs> 
So the, you know, as part of the assessment of immunogenicity, besides the clinical readout, if there's um, any hypersensitivity reaction that occurs um, for a given product, they, the analysis of uh, uh, antidrug antibody as, is, is, um, is conducted as well as the, the, um, um, the, what those antibodies do. Some antidrug antibodies do nothing in terms of their effect on the, the product. Some are neutralizing, and this is what's concerned, because this of concern, because this would result in decreased efficacy. And so the neutralizing antibodies are also part of the measurement. Yeah. I'd, I'd say that uh, the problem there is, is that with the drug tolerant assay, is that you can detect any drug antibodies in the presence of drug. And we don't know what those mean. And if there are differences in those things from the reference product, it can be a problem. And the notion that it's just all about neutralizing antibodies, I don't think is fully correct in that if you form antigen-antibody complexes to other idiotype, not just anti-idiotypic antibodies, but, but to, the, to other um, speed molecular configurations on the antibody, then that can re result in complexes and increased drug clearance. So, you know, it's complicated. But so PK is measured. Yeah, but what determines a, a, a significant difference in PK? Um, in an individual patient? In, in, in uh, yeah, okay, well, there, I, I don't see that. I don't think you can translate generic drugs to biosimilars. <laughs> we can move on. We'll have to discuss this later. So, David, you had a I question. Just, I did have a question for you, Stacey, um, related, but um, then you can clarify. My reading of the um, the interchangeable position of the FDA also said that the, the switching study would need to be performed in the indication of interest. Is that true? So in other words, would they have to do switching studies in Crohn's disease, or is it also going to be extrapolated? So, ex you know, the potential for extrapolation is, exists for a product that's seeking interchangeability okay. for a given um, um, you know, biosimilar that's seeking that designation, I think, you know, it would be, as with all biologics, whether they're standalones or biosimilar, it's case by case, so it depends on the particular product. So I, I can't answer it's that It's possible question. that it would need to be done in the disease indication of interest. Um, of interest to what? I mean, to the, right, you want the most sensitive patient population, the most sensitive, the most sensitive assay in which to determine the effect of the switching in terms of immunogenicity and then PK and PD if relevant. So safety is a big issue and a couple questions have come up. Is there any registry that's going to be formed or a way to track things? I know the, the initials and the uh, agents and Fleximab, uh, D1, you know, the different things will help us track things. Um, is that going to be any particular concerted effort to do so, so we can see if there's any signal directly? Anyone? Or Stacy? Well, Stacy, I, I, I don't think there's a post-approval. I am not aware of a sp any different surveillance. There was no post-approval requirement to perform a registry. So where would that likely occur? Probably among the rheumatologists. They're fairly organized as far as, uh, you know, I think they'll be all over this. The gastroenterology community is not going to be able to do it. We haven't been able to do the equivalent of what the rheumatologists have done with registries. There's a question with so many biosimilars in the pipeline, is there any guidance in helping to distinguish efficacy, which doesn't make sense, they should be similar. So. I think that um, the concern as well comes up if you switch from one to another, uh, a biosimilar one to biosimilar two, uh, should we use immune modulators in those patients, thinking that we might uh, immunize them to some degree? Because then you would have had three different agents perhaps, originator let's say, they're doing well and somehow they get switched to biosimilar one and then biosimilar two. That's that you know that definitely is a possibility that that will occur and and to take a step back and, and I I really tried to emphasize this in my talk that the foundation for approving a biosimilar is the analytical comparative data between the biosimilar and the reference product and so there's a slew of analytical assays that measure the heterogeneity within the reference product and the biosimilar product so 
you know, while we, you know, there's, so there's, if you, th if you think of a chromatog chromatogram and the distribution of the, of the molecule in terms of size and charge, the, the vast majority of each individual molecule will be, will be identical to each other. But then you have variations on the tails, right, of the distribution. That's, that goes for the reference product. It'll go for the biosimilar product. Um, you know, keep in mind the reference product throughout its, its lifetime, once it's approved, manufacturing changes occur to that reference product. And that may make some, you know, little differences that weren't, um, you know, initially part of the approval package. Nevertheless, it's comparable. It continues to be prescribed. There's not evidence that these are causing, um, you know, impacts on safety and, and effectiveness. It's the same with biosimilar. So in the case where you have, you know, it, if it were to happen in the future where we have multiple biosimilars on the market and a, a, a patient receives a biosimilar as their initial treatment and then they are switched to a different biosimilar, uh, there, it's, this, it's the same premise. There's the, the, the heterogeneity should be highly similar between the biosimilar and the reference product. The transitive property of biosimilars. No, I, I, I don't sense. think I'd agree with that. And I'll just I'll, I'll, I'll try to I'll try to I'll try to, I'll try to walk you through it. Okay. So so when you measure analytically the fucosylation patterns, you're not really measuring the difference potentially in the quaternary structure. You can't see down to the level of the individual molecule. And we know there are huge differences in the fucosylation patterns. Whether that translates into clinical immunogenicity or not, we don't know. And, and, and you know, this issue of the, sh the drift within the reference product, which is well established, no one has taken batches and then looked into the, the, all the patients exposed and seen whether there's differences in immunogenicity. No one's done that. Um, like I said, there's a, a look, no one looks in, for the reference product when it's licensed at every individual molecule because it's it's impossible. Um, you know, the 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 standard is that there are um, there's the products are highly similar in the degree to which that can be determined, and as time progresses, we're going to get even more and more advanced technology to do these kind of analyses. But right now, we are at a very advanced level. And um, uh, there's little question about the, um, the I, mean, I think, fucosylation amounts are pretty easily identified, um, or afucosylation amounts, if effector function is important. Uh, you know, there's, there's just a lot, of, a lot of information that we know analytically. Gary, let me. Um, Gary, let me just ask Brian a question. Brian, given what you've suggested and we have known from our own experience with just our reference agents, if somebody, if a patient is switched, would you recommend that we proactively check a therapeutic drug level and look for anti-drug antibodies? Well, in the absence of um, validated anti-drug antibodies specific to the agents that are, have been validated, your best is the PK. You know, and whether that's the point. I mean, if, you, if you've got, if you know that the patient is being non-medical switched between multiple, multiple agents, then probably in an individual patient, the preservation of the PK, because I believe you can compare across assays for drug, for drug level. So it's probably your benchmark. So maybe that so would the, be a There have been several do studies done looking at <laughs> different assays, at least three different assays. The Europeans have done so and otherwise, and they're rather similar when measured. Um, they're not large numbers of patients, but they're clearly been published, and they're not mainstream journals like Gastroenterology or American Journal of Gastroenterology or the IBD Journal, but they've been in some European journals. So I found these studies because I had to debate someone before at another meeting related to this. Um, Dr. Wolf? Yeah, <clears throat> Doug Wolf, Atlanta. Uh, thank you for being here, and um, yeah. This overall discussion is just awesome. I, I, I did want to say that uh, you know IBD patients are certainly different from RA patients and many of the biologics in that they are 
Uh, RA patients are typically on methotrexate. And again, increasingly, especially as a result of dialogue at this meeting, this 2017 meeting, I think increasingly we're thinking about monotherapy with the anti-TNF. So uh, I, I'm just thinking that it is a different, and so the immunogenicity uh, risk with uh, these switches may be greater with IBD patients because they're not going to be as protected as RA patients because of the lack of methotrexate or an immunomodulator in many cases. So I, I think that one of the big concerns we have, and maybe it's real or not, is the potential for immunogenicity with switching. Thank you. And, and hopefully, again, the analytical package that is submitted with the, with the biosimilar BLA would ad, would demonstrate clearly that the 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 product is is highly similar to the reference product, so that there's there the the cause of concern for there being a different immune response re after receiving the biosimilar should be diminished based on the fact that you have analytical similarity between the products. Well, I think the fact, Stacy, that you've, the, the agency has advocated for designation of interchangeability, that you have to do a proper multiple it's the switch. It's in the, it's in yeah, the law. So, so, but, but I guess the thing <laughs> that I'm, I'm, I'm confused in Canada and I'm confused in the United States about the fact that the, the federal statute is there or the requirement is there, and yet I hear that the states are just going to do what they want, and the, in Canada exactly the provinces right. are just going to do what they want, exactly despite the fact right. the federal government has said, this isn't a good idea, guys. I, I don't know what to do about it's happening that. Already. How, how does that happen? Any further questions, please come up and address. And if not, we'll end the session. I'd like to thank our speakers, Dr. Rubin, Dr. Fagan, Dr. Ricci, for a terrific <laughs> overview. And again, the AGA and the Crohn's Colitis Foundation for supporting this uh, venue.